So today I'm going to talk about data science in social spaces and specifically some of the tension between personalization and privacy that we see nowadays. Um, and before I start, I want to thank the organizers of this workshop for uh, invited, inviting me to talk about this. Uh, before I go into uh, the subject matter, um, I would like to just briefly talk about my background so you can understand where I'm coming from. Um, so I did my uh, PhD in computer science at the University of Maryland where I studied machine learning, social networks, and privacy, and the connection between those three. Um, and then I, I went to industry and worked as a data scientist for, for uh, five years where I built uh, large-scale uh, machine learning and recommender systems. Um, and then I decided to go back to academia, and I'm joining the University of Illinois at Chicago in the fall uh, as an assistant professor in computer science. And I'm spending a year in government as a AAAS fellow, as, as, as Rene mentioned, uh, sort of trying to understand the policy implications of, of big data and data science. As you know, um, social networks are ubiquitous nowadays. So they enhance many parts of, of our lives. They allow us to stay connected to uh, friends and colleagues across the globe. They allow us to share our thoughts with large audiences, uh, to share experiences, ideas, photos, uh, videos, and all kinds of uh, other contents. There are even emerging social networks around uh, sharing data. Uh, and if, if you'd like, you can also impersonate your, your dog or cat online and, and uh, connect to other uh, individuals who, who, who have dogs or cats. Um, and in, in this uh, kind of online social networks, we have a very uh, heterogeneous data that is often um, a challenge to um, uh, analyze for traditional machine learning algorithms where data is usually uh, represented as uh, some sort of a, a table where you have attributes uh, for people and you're trying to learn certain things about these people. Um, so in the last, um, I'd say 15 to 20 years, there has been an emergence of, of uh, algorithms that sort of uh, uh, try to take advantage of, of the network structure that, that we see in, in, uh, in these data sources. Um, so specifically, I wanted to mention uh, link mining, which is sort of a ty type of data mining where you explicitly take advantage of the links in the networks, and also statistical relational learning, which uh, tries to uh, connect um, um, machine learning again in, in these kind of um, um, relational uh, sort of data sets. And I would like to give you a couple of examples where these kinds of algorithms are being used. Uh, so the first one is a uh, very um, prominent example if you're using Twitter, because on Twitter you have this Twitter feed. And Twitter uses uh, different information about your social connections and the types of things you have liked over time in order to figure out what is most relevant for you at any given point in time. Um, and so this is just an example that basically shows you sort of mixed content. So there is, I have one ad here. I have a couple of uh, posts that um, sort of um, one is a, um, a group that has posted, so that's KD Nuggets, and then there is New York Times is also posting things, and then I have uh, one of my colleagues also po posting content. Um, so there is this emergence of like social recommenders and recommender systems that use uh, social information. Um, the second example I'd like to give is, is one that you may have noticed if you're using LinkedIn. Usually on the right-hand side, you can see uh, recommendations of uh, people you may know. Um, and this is using link prediction. So it's trying to figure out, uh, based on the connections you already have and what they know about you, what other people uh, may you know. So it, it, it helps you sort of um, uh, um, build your uh, online social network further. And the third example is uh, using uh, social networks uh, for um, usually marketing, but also sometimes in political campaigns uh, to sort of uh, diffuse information through your social uh, networks. And a good example here is, the, uh, is Obama's campaign, um, where they did uh, um, use sophisticated algorithms to figure out how they can influence people to go and vote. 
And with all of this uh, personalization and uh, using data to, to build uh, personalized services, there is, of course, the concern about uh, the control of our personal data. And this is a, a quote from a recent article that uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee uh, posted based on uh, sort of his reflections of uh, what has happened in the last 28 years uh, of the World Wide Web and what are some challenges that remain and th that we need to address. And the the first one on his list is this, we've lost control of our personal data. And you can uh, read what, what he said or find it online. There, there are a few things I, I have highlighted. Uh, first of all, that we um, uh, sort of give our personal data in order to get some free services uh, from different websites. Uh, these websites often have long and confusing terms and conditions. Um, and we often do not have a way of, of uh, feeding back to the companies what we would rather not share with, let's say, third parties or, or specific uh, people. <coughs> And this is, this is not to pick on Facebook, it's just an example I wanted to give because um, many companies change their privacy policies over time. So when uh, Facebook started, it would share uh, your information only with uh, members of groups you belong to. Um, and then it, started, it, it, it was changing it and changing it and changing it over time, where you can see like in 2009, 2010, for example, uh, many of, of the things on your pro profile were uh, set to, to uh, public by default. You had to actually put extra effort to make them private. Um, and these were subject to indexing, indexing by third party search. Uh, they may be imported and exported by Facebook and others without limitation. Um, so um, before I, I, I talk about some of my work, I wanted to sort of uh, give you the lay of the land of in, in terms of uh, this problem um, uh, of, of privacy and social networks. So uh, some of the initial uh, work in this uh, basically uh, brought up attention to, to the fact that uh, unlike uh, previous work in, in um, privacy preserving data mining, we, we are not talking only about identity and attribute disclosure, but we may also want to talk about link disclosure. Maybe we want to keep uh, certain connections between uh, people private, so it's a, it's a new type of uh, risk. Um, and a lot of the earlier work uh, sort of um, concentrated on uh, anonymizing uh, data sets that, that, can, that are basically social networks. So some of the initial work by uh, Backstrom and, and his co-authors was uh, this idea that if you remove all information from a social network but you just leave the structure, you're still leaking a lot of information because people have very specific sort of structural properties in, in the network. Um, and there were, there's a lot of work on structural anonymization if you, if you Google it. Um, but as we all know, anonymization comes with uh, lots of limitations. Some of it is, is uh, that its utility is often non not very good, but also that you can still re-identify people wh when you anonymize data. And more recently, there has been some work on uh, sort of differentially private uh, um, approaches to, to analyzing graphs. Uh, some of the other work that, that uh, has emerged in this space is uh, sort of understanding what are the privacy risks of, of participating in online social networks. Um, and here I'm giving an, um, um, an example of my work, and that's actually the one I'm going to talk more about for the rest of the talk, which is about inferring information in, in social networks. Um, there is also work on, on uh, privacy scores, which basically tries to put a number to how much information you have disclosed in a social network so that you can compare your privacy score to other people's privacy scores. Um, and there, there's some theoretical, uh, game theoretic uh, frameworks that uh, have come out as well uh, to understand this, uh, again, this tension uh, and trade-off between uh, giving your, your data, uh, releasing information, but also like preserving your privacy. Um, there is some work on uh, management of uh, privacy settings and what you can do to, um, or how, what tools can do for you to help you manage your privacy. So some of the first work in this space was this work on uh, privacy wizards, and so th they they basically uh, stated that uh, users have uh, privacy uh, preference models that we can potentially infer from data, so that we can help uh, users manage their privacy better. 
<laughs> and there is some work related to how we can frame these privacy settings and what that means. And so there's some interesting work that basically shows what is the what happens when you show like more granular privacy settings versus less granular, and there were some negative results there. Um, which I'm talking, uh, I'm, hap I'm happy to talk mo about more of this uh, work at, at the end if, if anyone is interested. Um, and there's some emerging, uh, there's some emerging frameworks that are uh, coming out these days to to sort of uh, connect privacy and fairness. Basically stating that we have uh, privacy, uh, the privacy uh, intrusion occurs when you're being treated unfairly, you're being uh, discriminated against, and then the question is how can we create the tools that can sort of identify when that happens. And here the idea is that your data is out there, your data is public, so now what can we do about it? Let's find some solutions. And this one is not specific to social networks, but I wanted to highlight it because it's one of the interesting newer works. Um, there is also work uh, related to sort of understanding how people currently use their privacy settings. Um, so for example, there is work by Fiesler and, and uh, a number of other co-authors uh, to, to show that uh, users are usually private. So, so Content online is not is is private by users, not by content type. So it's not that you mark certain types of content as private and others as as public, but you're usually choosing that you will make everything private or everything everything public. And there is also this recent work on sort of identifying based on your privacy settings, uh, privacy personas. So trying to understand um, how people actually use these privacy settings. So one example here would be this. Um, so I know it's hard to read, but um, let's say privacy maximizers. I'm probably one of those people. So for example, they withhold contact information, they withhold basic information, but then for some of the other things, they are not so uh, uh, concerned about. And now I'm going to uh, motivate the work that I'm uh, going to describe and I have uh, worked on. So e here I'm, I'm showing you um, a privacy profile on, uh, on Facebook. And this is a hypothetical profile. This is Alice Smith is not a real person. Um, it's sort of a, an aggregate of different profiles. And uh, usually when you look at Facebook profile, independent on, on how close you are to this person and what they have decided to reveal to you. Uh, but some of the most prominent uh, information is this friendship list and like who this person has befriended and also what types of things uh, they like. And this is especially true for people you're not friends with. So they often would sort of hide the things on their profile. You may not be able to see their posts, but you may still be able to see their friends and, and certainly their likes. And here I'm just highlighting what the social links and group affiliations are, because then I will also show you a representation of this sort of list information as graphs, like what it means to represent it as graphs. Um, so the basic premise uh, of, of, of the work that I'm going to describe is that uh, these group affiliations often cannot be hidden. And that was certainly the case uh, when we did this work. So likes were uh, public by default and public by force because you could not actually change that setting. If you like things, they're public, they're out there. So usually if you, if you want to stay private, you either like should not like things um, or, or be okay with that. Um, and so the hypothesis here is that you can predict private attribute based on public information. So let's say we cannot see Alice Smith's personal information, like where she lives or, um, well, in this case, we can probably infer her gender relatively easily, um, but also, let's say, her age, uh, whether she's married, and, and other demographic kind of information. And the other assumption here, and that's a very um, uh, realistic assumption, is that in these social networks we have a mixture of public and private profiles. And some of your friends are going to have public profiles, and some of them are going to have private profiles. And potentially an adversary can exploit this information in order to learn things about you. So, um, and we assume that social links and group affiliations are always public, but I will show you what happens when, when that assumption is relaxed. The goal of the adversary here is to, to predict um, uh, attributes in the, in the private profiles. 
Um, and we assume that we have a very powerful adversary who can build probabilistic models, which nowadays with the sort of prominence of data science everywhere, almost everyone can sort of take an off-the-shelf algorithm and, and run it against the uh, data they've chosen. OK, so I, I said that uh, I, want, I, I will first show you how we move from these like lists of, of connections and lists of uh, groups to, to networks. Um, so when we look at uh, your friendship list, basically we can construct a graph. And that's a, very, uh, that's a typical way in computer science that we represent uh, these networks. So we have people and people's profiles as nodes. And we have um, friendship links in the Facebook case, for example, as, as uh, links. Uh, and here I'm giving again, some hypothetical toy network, um, just to, to exemplify what I'm doing. And in terms of the affiliation network, so we have these different types of things that people like, and we can build a bipartite graph based on it to show who likes uh, what, what um, uh, pages. So now I'm, I'm moving into uh, how we actually uh, do this. So uh, again, we're interested in sensitive attribute disclosure. And sensitive attribute disclosure would occur when an adversary is able to determine the value of a user attribute that the user intended to stay private. And so, so in this case, we basically uh, uh, look at some specific attribute. In this case, I'm giving an example of gender. Um, and uh, we have uh, we know we know the value of, of gender for some people, and we're trying to infer uh, this attribute for for other people by using uh, the information in the social network. And similarly, you can you can see that like you can see the same kind of information in the affiliation network. So now I'll talk about how, how you can do this using uh, these more sophisticated kind of classification algorithms. Um, so if, if we were to take uh, sort of a traditional machine learning algorithm, again, I mentioned earlier, this is usually assumes that you have some sort of uh, tabular data so that each person is represented as a row with some attributes about this person. And maybe in this case, we're interested to, to figure out whether, let's say, Alice is liberal or not. Um, so we know that uh, David is, is liberal, but we don't know whether Alice is. And so how do we use this information to infer that? In the traditional machine learning algorithm, like you will use some, some such attributes to infer that. But as I mentioned before, our assumption here is that Alice's profile is private. So we cannot see any of the other attributes on her profile to, do, uh, to apply this directly. Um, so then there are a couple of other things we can do here. So one of them is using the social link. So trying to infer based on uh, her friend's information what her information is. And also using information based on the groups that she belongs to, again, to infer whether she is liberal or not. And there are some ways to do this also by sort of inferring um, uh, latent traits. In this case, maybe they both have liberal parents. Therefore, they're more likely to be liberal as well. So um, I will not go into detail of these algorithms. So that would take probably too much time, but sort of want to, to, to give you some idea that we tried a few different algorithms that uh, either do not use uh, any information. So in this case, uh, if we don't have the links and we just have these uh, rows of data where we have labels for some and not labels for others, usually one of the best things we can do here is sort of infer that this person has the majority label. So if most of the people are, are female, in the network, then this person is more likely to be female, right? So that's, this is one of our uh, baselines. Um, and then we have a number of algorithms that uh, use this social network information, that use the affiliation network information, and sort of combine the two. So I just want to show you what happens when, when we try these different algorithms. Uh, so in the paper, we actually use four different um, uh, network, uh, network data sets. Uh, but here, I'll just, I'll just show you uh, what happens when we apply this to Flickr and, and uh, to a Flickr and Facebook uh, data set. The first one was one that we collected. It was just a snowball sample uh, on Flickr. Snowball sample means that you start from one node, and then you start expanding based on this node. So the friends, and then friends of friends, and so on. Um, and it, it contains around 10,000 profiles. Um, the other data set that we used was all freshmen in Harvard. And this was a data set released um, uh, by uh, the, some researchers uh, at Harvard uh, on, on the Dataverse um, uh, data repository. Um, so they, uh, it contains 1,600 profiles. And it was a very, um, 
very rich data set because of the ways they actually collected this data. And here we'll be trying to predict uh, gender and political views, uh, gender out of two possible values and political views out of six possible values. And I forgot to mention that on Flickr, what we were trying to infer was the location of, of a user. So if you hide your location, can we predict it based on all this information I, I, I mentioned earlier? Um, and we assign each profile to be public with probability 50%. We train the model on the public profile data and predict on private profile. This is very standard sort of machine learning scenario. Um, and I will also show you results on what happens when we uh, take this 50% assumption so that you can see like based on what percent of profiles are, are public versus uh, private, how that affects your own privacy. So th this is a summary uh, of the findings. And so I'll try to walk you through, through these uh, graphs. Um, so let's first take a look at uh, the Flickr graph, which is on the top right. Um, so if we just try to randomly guess the location of a person, because we have 55 possible values, uh, the accuracy of that would be 2%, right? So it's 100 over uh, 55. If we uh, <coughs> try to predict just the majority label, which in this case was the United States, so majority of, of users were from, from the US, we'll have 27.7% accuracy. If we used uh, the social network information or who this person has befriended, <clears throat> then we go up to 56.5%. And if we use group information, that accuracy goes up to 63.5%. And I'll spend a bit of time to describe that, the highest green bar there, which is a little bit different from the other bars. So 63.5, um, and when we combine the information, it goes up to 64.8%. Um, so the dark green bar, what that represents is that, so, so, so what happens is that when you try to use group information, certain groups are more predictive of the sensitive attributes than others. So you can think about, uh, for example, let's say I'm trying to predict gender, and therefore maybe I find a group that is sort of, let's say it's about breastfeeding, maybe uh, in this case there'll be a lot of women in this kind of group. And we can automatically infer without knowing the semantics, what are the groups that sort of have homogeneous uh, body of members. Um, and when we do that, and let's, we find only groups that are very homogeneous in terms of the attribute we're trying to predict, our accuracy can go much higher. So in this case, um, if we, if we find the most homogeneous groups, uh, now some, some of our users are not going to belong to any homogeneous group, so we can't make a prediction on everyone. But in this case, we're able to make a prediction on 50% of the users with much higher accuracy. So this, from a machine learning standpoint, is not so interesting. It's interesting from a privacy standpoint, right? Because there are certain users that have much higher risk of participation in, in social networks because of these homogeneous groups that they belong to. Um, and I'm, if, if, you, if you have questions, please let me know. So, so let's take a look at Facebook. On Facebook, um, again, as we increase the type of, as, as we uh, start using more information, we are able to, to increase sort of the performance. Um, and, and here, actually, uh, the usage of homogeneous groups did increase performance by 4%, but it was not as, as radical as the one on, on Flickr. And when we were trying to, to predict political views, as you can see, the, the lines are not going much higher. And so this was, this was an interesting result. And so we tried to actually understand why, why this is the case. Um, and so we had a few hypotheses. One of them is the fact that this is a freshman class at Harvard. And the groups that we were using were the movies they like, the books they like, and the music they like. And potentially, these were not necessarily groups that are predictive of, of uh, sort of political leaning. That was one of the hypotheses. The other hypothesis we found in the political science literature, which is the fact that people are usually conservative about some issues and liberal about others. And it's not, it's not very straightforward to say, I'm just this one label. So, so these are the hypotheses of, of like why this is the case. And it would be interesting to try this on a different data set and different type of uh, uh, likes to, to see if the results will be different. Yes. It was all given in the data set. This data set. Everything was given? Right. So we simulate like what happens if we have some percent of pri pri private profiles and, and so on. 
Um, and this is just some follow-up work that we did where we're trying to sort of use um, this, the structure of the social networks to see if we can get even uh, better accuracy. And we were able to increase this accuracy by uh, 3%. But I, I, I'm not going to spend time on that unless you want me to at the end of this talk. So <clears throat> I said earlier that we made this assumption that 50% of users had uh, public profiles and 50% had private profiles. But some of the recent work that we have looked at actually shows that nowadays around 75% of users on Facebook have private profiles. And so the question here is, um, we didn't know that, by the way, at the time when we were doing this work, but we were still interested in this question of how the privacy of others uh, uh, impacts your own privacy and what happens when we vary the number of, of public profiles uh, in the network. So we varied it from 10 to 90% and trying to, to, to predict uh, on the rest. So in this case, you can see that even even with very few uh, public profiles, you can still achieve a rather high uh, accuracy when you're trying to predict uh, attributes. And the other experiment that we did was related to, to this observation that very homogeneous groups leak a lot of information. So what we were interested to do was to see what happens when we only study users who have um, <clears throat> well, who have uh, less less who have who participate in less homogeneous groups and basically what this is sh showing is that um, as you uh, increase the um, as you start removing these uh, groups that um, uh, are very homogeneous then uh, your, uh, your our accuracy was basically decreasing again uh, sort of saying that if you participate in homogeneous groups that yeah, then it will be more likely for us to predict your attribute and some of the main takeaways here is that um, it's increasingly challenging to manage personal information online and in this case I showed you that probabilistic uh, models can infer hidden information and circumvent privacy preferences of users um, in this case one of the interesting findings was that groups are the most significant carriers of private information uh, when we started this work we had the hypothesis that your friends will be the most significant carriers of uh, personal information but it's really more about your interests and the things you like um, and as far as privacy concerned users, uh, the, one, one of the recommendations coming out of this work is to, so, to, to make sure that you, you set this uh, group and friendship list as private. And uh, in terms of social media businesses, the recommendation was that they should enable uh, greater user control over the release of information. Uh, in terms of policymakers, um, would like to see more standards for uh, personal data uh, release practices. And that's it. Oh, <coughs> how much do you think those results would be the same for different kinds of attributes that mm -hmm. you targeted, things other than country and gender and political views? If those same takeaways would still apply? Or? So there was work uh, that was published uh, by the National Academies, I think it came out in 2013, which was basically studying um, how you can, uh, which was basically studying predicting uh, personal information in terms of, um, they actually varied quite a few, like psychological traits. So predicting psychological traits of people based on likes, and they had some very strong results as well. So there has been other work that sort of uh, confirmed this. Yes. Given, given your work on threat and render systems, uh, I'm going to move away a little bit from, <coughs> from collaborative filtering to things like interest graphs. It seems like now the possibilities of, of getting to the sensitive attributes expand dramatically. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Are you interested in influence analysis as well? Because that's probably one of the bigger issues with the social networks. They are actually influencing the opinion of people. And uh, we've seen it uh, as a good example you know, very recently. So. Well, let me put a plug right here. So we're organizing a workshop on uh, data science and journalism, and one of the topics is exactly the one you mentioned. That will be at KDD 2017. Great. 
And also the second concern on, of Sir Tim Berners-Lee was also related to sort of this spread of fake information and how the web is enabling it. Yep. So you mentioned that for the hybrid security work, uh, you based all the analysis on three types of, uh, of groups that you belong to, right? So do you have to work, was this all the information that you had or did you hand pick some? Uh, that, was all, that was all the information we had. We didn't handpick anything. At the time, it was very hard to, to, to find Facebook data sets. I see. So I, I think that maybe... And let me know if I don't answer your question, but that may be related to this fact of, of uh, if you, when you use more homogeneous groups, they're more predictive. So in that case, we handpick, right? So we use actually entropy to assess the groups that are more homogeneous, and then from there, just you handpick those and use them as features in, in the machine learning models to predict. So that would apply even if you have any kind of likes, right? I can only find the, the pages where uh, users are homogeneous in terms of the attribute that I'm trying to predict, get those and then build much more powerful models because otherwise there is a lot of noise. So there, I, one thing I forgot to mention, but but uh, the types, the, the the number of content that is being shared is is humongous. So by now, Facebook has almost two billion users, uh, and about half of them are active daily on their mobile. So that's that's powerful. And also on top of that, uh, they the some of the recent statistics I was looking at uh, showed that people share. Um, I think it was five billion pieces of content per day. Um, so all of these pieces of content can potentially be predictive, like pieces of information, but uh, you really need to sort of sift through this information. You cannot use all of them in order to predict something. It's more important to focus on these like sort of homogeneous um, yeah. sources. Yeah, yeah that, that was my point, that it's more important actually that you right? use homogeneous groups rather than having your own biases on what you expect to be more important. Right, right, right. Yeah, so the models were not able to pick that up as much as we would hope. Any other questions? All right. Wow. Very good.